Good evening and welcome to uh, Driver's Ed tonight. We'll wait as we normally do for people to sign in. So remember, once again, because some people are forgetting this, you have to sign in on your phone. Texting, texting your name that you're here. Also do it on Google. So we'll just wait a few minutes until we get the numbers up. Looks like we've got about four people. So my phone should indicate that you're here. Here we go. Hope everybody's having a good evening. I don't know about you, but it's awfully warm in this room. Uh, it wasn't quite this warm yesterday, but uh, tonight, for some reason, it's retaining its temperature. So you may see some sweat on my forehead if I uh, keep all the lights on. I have lights on either side. You can probably see it reflecting in my glasses, uh, just so that uh, we have a good clear view of things um, let's do some housekeeping before we get going on tonight's class um, remember to go to Facebook and download you were supposed to do this last night chapter 3 oh, we got some noise on the outside I don't know if you can hear that or not but from responsible driving I have a worksheet that deals with signs, signals, and payment markings, you should send that to me. Also, part of your homework was to do uh, Chapter 12. I think that there were like uh, 10 to 12 questions uh, dealing with braking, speed, um, the the physics of, of stopping a vehicle and accelerating, and that's going to be what we're getting into a little bit later tonight after uh, we get going. So we weren't able to finish up last night's topic on signs, signals, and payment markings. We kind of ended with uh, shared turn lanes. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, zipper lanes and reversible lanes, things like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about the roadway that we're driving on. So in your notes, I want you to write down that most traffic lanes will be between 9 and 15 feet. Okay, so from the white edge line to the right, we also call that the fog line, by the way, the white line to the right of you, to the yellow line, everybody thinks that the distance is the same. It is not. Okay, so depending on where you're driving, that width of that lane is going to shrink or it's going to get bigger. Now, what I want you to understand, most rural areas you're going to be looking at a 10 to 9 foot uh, lane width. Once you get up onto a faster road like an interstate, you're going to be going 12 to 15. And the thing about a wider lane also creates faster speeds, which means that when people feel that they're safer, when they see all this extra pavement, they have a tendency to want to go um, a lot faster. Whereas if you're like in downtown Portsmouth, where the roads are very narrow, we have a tendency, afraid that we're going to hit the curb or hit a car that's coming towards us, so we bring our speed way down. So our environment, and we're going to talk about this later tonight, uh, will affect what we do with speed. And of course, speed relates to stopping distance. And I think the state did a good job, at least in the old manual, where it talks about stopping first and then it deals with speed and i don't think in the new manual they quite do it the same way um, but i'll have to, to check but tonight's powerpoint basically came from the older manual that we had but i want to show you it's called road diet so you know when someone goes on a diet they're trying to sh change the shape of their body or the weight of their body well there's something called road diet where we try to change our lane width, like I was saying earlier, to accommodate an additional lane, like a bike lane or a special left turn lane. So I want to show you this clip that I found 
on on road diet. I showed you the same road a few years earlier. Notice anything different? Here's a better angle of that. The old road has four lanes for traffic. The new one has two. And now there's this middle lane for left-hand turns. There's also a new bike lane. This is what transportation planners call a road diet. And it's a very popular way to make the roads safer. Over the course of the 20th century, four lane roads became an American institution. It all started with the release of Ford's Model T in 1908. A few decades later, there was one car for every two households in the States. And by the 1960s, many roads became so busy that traffic engineers had to figure out how to add capacity. So they added lanes. A lot of pavement was getting put on the ground, even where maybe the population and the traffic volumes weren't so high that really we needed that pavement, but we wanted that pavement. Sometimes, you know, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. Fast forward to the present day, and we're left with some overbuilt roads that are pretty unsafe. And crash reduction is a major benefit that planners can achieve with just a bit of paint. Four lane roads have quite a few conflict points. Those are places where accidents could happen. These are merging accidents, left turn lane crashes, and rear ends. Now look at what a three lane reconfiguration does. There are far fewer crash points. A road diet can also make left hand turns suck way less. The shared middle lane takes left turners out of the traffic flow, so they won't hold up drivers who want to continue through. And now left turners will only have to cross one lane of traffic instead of two, which will eliminate broadside accidents. And the benefits don't end there. By slimming each lane in the road, the road diet can reduce travel speeds by around seven miles an hour. Narrower lanes can cause that psychological impact on the driver to slow down a little bit. The Federal Highway Administration notes that smaller lanes reduce driving speeds. And while a six mile an hour difference may seem modest, it can make an auto accident much less deadly. Narrower lanes also leave more space for expanded sidewalks or bike lanes. Your pedestrians feel safer. It might have given you more green space to separate them from your vehicle. And your bicyclist might have a dedicated space to, to ride. In the midst of these changes, the amount of traffic lane has gone from two to one. So if you drive a car, you might assume that the trade-off of a road diet would be congestion. How could traffic not increase? That's usually their concern before a road diet is implemented. That is not what happens. The volume of the roadway is still sustained. We wouldn't want to put a four to three lane conversion on a piece of roadway that would then push half your traffic somewhere else. And what we found in, in a couple of places is that it actually makes moving through town easier. But traffic flow is only one part of the equation. You've got to also balance commercial and safety benefits too. Especially if this is through a urban corridor where you've got businesses, you've got coffee shops, it works. It keeps people moving. It doesn't take traffic away from that corridor. And it reduces those, those rear ends that then do stop the road. So the state of Iowa is conducting a new road survey because it's worked really well for them. A study of 15 streets in the state saw a crash reduction rate of nearly 50%. At the same time, the diet didn't substantially disrupt other activities along the corridors. A key factor was the traffic volume, measured by engineers as annual average daily traffic. Most road diets will run into problems as you approach that 15,000 vehicle number. In Iowa, many roads don't get that much traffic. The same could not be said for the suburban context in California. A study comparing road diets in Iowa to corridors in California showed that California's streets average about double the amount of daily traffic. The same kinds of road diets resulted in a much lower crash reduction rate in California, significantly lower than the reductions in Iowa. This is not to say that the road diets in California are an outright failure. It's just a difference of context for the road diet, and the success of a road diet is driven by so many other factors economic impact, land use, or level of service, to name a few. So the case for road diets is pretty clear. They do slow down streets, and they do reduce crashes. But whether or not that's worth the trouble depends very much on the context of the world that surrounds the road.
So you can see that the main reason why we have road diet or change of our roadway system is to let people go at a slower speed, which is going to create a safer environment for people to uh, drive in. Uh, but you've got to remember when you're going from state to state, your roadways will look slightly different. Just like the picture that we have on uh, the slide right now, this is going to be confusing for a lot of people and you're going to want to move up right next to those green vehicles. And I thought this was kind of humorous. So hopefully you get my sense of humor here. I was with a student and we were waiting for the traffic light to turn green. Now, do you see anything that's a little bit um, strange about the vehicle in front of the motorcycle in front of us? How many of you realized when you saw this picture that the state trooper is beyond his stop line? He is not supposed to be there. Okay, He did not follow the rules that he is trying to make others follow. So I thought that was kind of ironic. Like I said, that's my warped sense of humor. Um, and I have no idea who that is. Uh, the next thing I want to speak on is school bus safety. We're going to be heading back towards school in the next three or four months. Hopefully we'll be back into classrooms come September or late August. Uh, hopefully once you get a license, you're not going to have to take a school bus. But I'm sure at some point in your life, you had to ride a school bus so most new drivers can basically understand what to do with a school bus because you've watched other people do it but they don't know the technical part of what is required they're just stopping and not knowing when to go or how far to stop in front or behind so i want you to write these things down before a school bus will actually come to a complete stop they have to have their yellow lights warning you that they're stopping up ahead. So as a driver, this is what I want you to write down. The minute you see yellow lights, look for who they're picking up. Look for a driveway where there are young kids waiting at the end or a school bus stop. Maybe the kids aren't out yet. So look for a corner of a road. Look for a house where there's a, a long driveway where there's going to be a kid maybe running down from the driveway. And then after school when they let people off the school bus you want to stay back um, when the red lights are on 25 feet and a lot of people will tell me that they don't have a good concept of any type of footage question so i always try to correlate a number with something that you can visualize so in your notes what i want you to write down and i'll help you remember this number 25 feet is probably the distance of two car lengths. So when you stop behind a school bus, say to yourself, I think I could squeeze two cars in front of me. If you can remember that squeezing two cars in front of me, that two is going to give you an idea when there's a test that you're looking for a number with a two at the beginning. And here we have 25. So if it had a possible answer for 20 or 25, it would be confusing. Um, but if it was like, 10, 15, 25, 30, you basically would know right off what it is. So always look for kids getting out. Now, sometimes kids will wander around a, a school bus after it's been let off, but be very, very careful when you still have kids off to the side of the road and where they're focusing their attention. And don't think that you're going to be able, if you're not paying attention, well, there's nobody around. I'll still go around it. I'm not going to get caught. Uh, in your notes, I want you to have a basic idea of what the penalty will be because you won't find it unless you look for it online. The penalty for going by a school bus is $500 in our state. And they assess what they call demerit points. And these are points that are negative points against your license. And they're going to take your license away when you have so many points accumulated that a DWI, driving while intoxicated and going by a school bus, have the same demerit points. They really, really frown upon that. Uh, here's, we were behind in, in Durham. This was probably two years ago. Uh, this was after school. We were doing a, a driving lesson. We were out on some of the back rural roads. Here's a bus from
Oh, Lord, have mercy. Terror at a school bus stop in Tampa this morning. I didn't know which kid to help because there was so many laying on the ground. Witnesses say a speeding car slammed into five children and two adults, leaving one child in critical condition. The driver now in custody. One of four accidents at school bus stops in just the past three days. In central Pennsylvania this morning, a seven-year-old killed in a hit and run. The driver never even stopping to help. While in Mississippi, this man is now charged with aggravated assault after a nine-year-old was struck and killed. And in Indiana, a community is mourning three siblings killed this week crossing the road on their way to the bus. That driver also facing charges. Some 25 million students nationwide ride a school bus, but experts say getting on and off can be the most dangerous time, especially this time of year. Right before daylight saving time ends, it's often dark as children wait in the morning. So reflective clothing or backpacks can help and teach children to line up away from the street, stay alert, and never assume a driver will stop. A deadly lesson learned the hard way for so many this week. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, New York. Hey, NBC News fans. I can't think of anything that would be more devastating as a driver is to hit a pedestrian, and especially a young child uh, that is waiting to get on a bus or come off a bus. And I really feel bad for the family that lost all their children, all three of them, uh, from that horrific uh, car crash. Now, I, I truly believe that these incidents should never, ever happen. And it has to be caused by two things. It has to be caused by excessive speed and not paying attention. Okay. If you're going to be driving faster than the speed limit, you should be paying attention to the road. You have to be on top of your game. And I don't think that's a right thing to do. And I definitely don't agree with uh, looking at your phone and we're going to have a whole class on distraction. But I just wanted to show you um, that newscast because it was it was a bad week, and I said, "Oh, I've got to get this uh, for class." There's the three kids that I was talking about in Indiana. Really sad. Okay, let's talk about railroad crossings now. Throughout the country, we do use the rails to get uh, people to where they're going. We have Amtrak that will take us from Dover or Durham into Boston so we can get people. Um, but we do also use our railroads for moving goods. So some of these trains are going to be extremely long and they can get up ahead of speed. So in your notes, what I want you to write down is that when a train is up to its full capability of speed, it takes close to a mile for them to stop. So don't think because it looks like they're going 30, 40 miles per hour, it's the weight that's making this distance so long. It's not so much the speed, well, it's the speed and the weight. But I find that most crashes that happen with cars and trains is because people aren't obeying. And by the way, what is the shape of that sign that we have in the picture? Anybody wanna throw that up on, on comments on Google, Google on YouTube. Um, and I'll keep talking and see who comes up with what the shape of that sign is. But I do want you to write down, and you do need to know this for the midterm, you must not stop any closer than 15 feet, nor more than 50 feet. Now, I'm more concerned that when you drive with me that you at least stop the 15. The 50, okay, could be 60, 70 feet. I'm not too, I'm not gonna, you know, kill you on being further than 50 feet, but I will get after you if you stop closer than 15. And the reason why you don't want to be closer than 15, because, and I'm going to go to my picture, is that from the bottom of the train to the top of the cart, so where the rail is to the top of the cart is 12 to 15 feet. So if you're stopped right next to a train and the train derails, it's going to come right on top of you okay and it's gonna it's gonna crush you it, it's gonna be extremely dangerous but 50 feet 60 feet back that's fine they, they kind of like 50 or closer because if you're too far back people may not see the flashing red lights and they'll go around you and then they can't stop uh, for the 15 feet so that's why that is um, important and by the way there is a sign nobody's guessed 
Did someone say? Let me see. No one's guessed what the... Well, it is an X, okay? It is that X has a special name, though. Okay, let's see. It's I'll give it to you. Okay, good guess, though, Anthony. Uh, cross buck. Okay, the shape of the sign is a cross buck. That X is called a cross, cross buck sign. And the sign that you have right before it will be a yellow circle. So it's a warning sign that's a railroad, and then there's going to be the cross buck. And the other thing that I want to mention is that railroads are extremely dangerous in rural areas. Um, let me explain. In a rural area, you're not going to have the blinking lights. You're going to have a stop sign. So people will see a train and they're going to say, oh, if I just pick up my speed a little bit, I'll make it before that train that's coming. And they don't want to wait for that long, you know, 75, 85, you know, long train carts going by. So they try to beat the train. But what happens a lot of times, if you read in the paper about any crashes, is that they pick up so so much speed that when they get closer, they realize the train's coming faster than they thought. So now they've got to stop for the train and they can't stop for the train and they go right into the side. And I honestly think, and hopefully nobody in this class has somebody, a relative or a friend that's ever hit a train. But if there is a train vehicle crash, it is probably the problem of the driver, not the engineer. So you have to be an all time bad driver to hit a train because the train's not hitting you because they only go in two directions. They go forward and they go back. The first train car northbound is on fire. We have multiple injuries. 600,000 ton train that could be barreling down and hitting you. We hit a big truck. We're on the ground. It's a horrifying experience. Hundreds of people are killed at crossings every year, and these are completely preventable. One of the ways we can prevent these accidents is for the public to do their job. The emergency notification system provides motorists or pedestrians with a phone number that they can call, and then we'll be able to stop train traffic that's heading in that direction. the first phone call you want to make if there's anything happening at a crossing. You want to stop any oncoming train. Every grade crossing is protected with an emergency notification sign. What that provides is an emergency notification phone number that the passenger or the motorist can immediately notify the railroad of any emergency at that crossing. The locator crossing number, which is six digits and a letter, can effectively tell the train dispatcher exactly where they are. When you call that number, you're talking to the train dispatcher that's specifically associated with that railroad. You'll get a response right away. The train dispatcher picks up, and he's going to ask, what location are you at? You give him that DOT number, just stay clear of the tracks. Let the dispatcher handle everything from that point on. Once you get that call in, for me to contact my, the locomotive engineer on the train, it could be five, ten seconds. I'm going to get him on the radio immediately and say, bring your train to a safe stop. This, we have an emergency situation ahead. Call 911 is not going to stop the train from coming. The first responder is your train dispatcher in this case. That 800 number is going to get you right to the first responder. Unfortunately, far too often people get complacent around railroad tracks. That's really a recipe for harm or, or disaster. 
if you're towing a vehicle, um, if you're a fire engine responding to an emergency situation, you still need to let the railroad know that you're in that space, that you are close to the tracks or you're on the tracks. The ENS sign can be located in many places, either on the cross buck, directly at the crossing, or on the silver box, which is usually located adjacent to the crossing. So you should call it if you suspect that the gates are malfunctioning, if you see a vehicle that's stuck on the tracks, if you see any suspicious activity, if you see something that looks out of place, or an object that's obstructing the tracks. As soon as your vehicle is stuck on the tracks and the crossing is activated, you need to get away from that vehicle as soon as possible and run at a 45 degree angle towards the train. Far too many times we see people trying to save their vehicles. And the unfortunate reality is when they're trying to save their vehicles, in many cases they lose their life. These incidents also have a profound impact on locomotive engineers. Because that individual it may have long-term effects from this incident that affect them professionally and personally. It's not, it's not gonna stop. If something happens and you are stuck on the grade crossing, the first thing you want to do is get your car off. So just drive through the gate. The gates are meant to break away, and so you will be able to get to the other side. You never want to be stuck at a crossing. So don't try to get over the crossing until you know you can get to the other side. Don't be stuck in traffic and sitting on a grade crossing, on a railroad crossing, in the path of a train. It's a horrifying experience. We've had careers that have been ended as a result of these incidents. Every one of these accidents breaks our heart, and we need to do everything we possibly can to keep people off those crossings and away from trains. A lot of folks look at active grade crossings where you have gates and arms as an inconvenience and an annoyance. Those arms are not there to prevent you from being where you want to be, but to help you get there safely. Okay, I think one of the most important things that they, they gave you for information here is to run at a 45 degree angle if your car is stuck on the tracks. Now, I think it's important to call that number that they have posted on the, on the tracks, but I think a lot of times people will just freak out and they'll forget about, you know, maybe a simple thing like that. Um, but if you can remember it, that's cool. And I think that's going to help you out. But like I said, it, it's amazing how many people do foolish things and they get caught and they don't know how to make it better. And like they said, those those gates break away. So just drive right through them. I believe I've got an article about an elderly woman that did not want to accelerate through the gates. So here's a woman in Massachusetts that um, the commuter train was coming and she got caught on the tracks and she didn't drive through the warning system. It had told her that the train was coming, but she got caught underneath the uh, uh, gates and um, they weren't able to stop and uh, hit the woman and she was killed. But then again, look at she's 91, so she could have probably been uh, extremely confused by what happened and uh, the train guardrail uh, arm coming down on her just probably freaked her out and she just probably froze. Okay, let's talk about something that is one of the most difficult things to understand in driving. 
So I want you to take really extremely good notes on this. This is probably one of the most important things that we're covering uh, the first half hour of class here. The law doesn't give anyone the right of way. It only says who must yield it. So I like telling students a better word for yield. If you really don't understand what yield means, substitute the word yield for wait. So let's read the question or read the statement again. The law doesn't give anyone the right of way. It only says who must wait for it. Okay, so it's telling you that you've got to wait. So generally at an intersection with no traffic control, so there's no sign or signal, the vehicle on the right gets to go first. They have the right of way. So if you're approaching someone that's to the right of you, you are yielding, you are waiting for them. Now, there are different situations that will help you determine right of way. So this is right from the manual. So this should be something, if you don't want to write it down, just make sure you go back and highlight it. Uh, I believe it is in um, uh, section six. A vehicle in the intersection has the right of way over a car that's preparing to enter. So if you're there first and there's nobody else, then you get to go first. A vehicle going straight has the right of way over someone that's turning left. So if you're going straight and the car that's coming towards you wants to turn in front of you, they've got to wait for you to go first. All emergency vehicles responding to an alarm, to an emergency, they have the right of way. So we would pull over to the side of the road, put our signal on, wait for them to go by us, would put our signal to get back onto the road and then would leave. But we have to yield if they're coming up behind us. Pedestrians in a crosswalk. Okay, that's that's a given. Now, a lot of people say, do they have to be completely all the way across? Now, the way it's written in the law book, I believe it states that they have to go all the way across just in case they were to change their mind. I have told my students, as long as you feel comfortable, they've gone past the center of the road and it's an older pedestrian, not a young child that could be confused. See, a young child that may change their mind, I'd still probably wait till they got all the way over to the other side. But if it's a college kid, they get past that yellow line, then just go slowly and go by. Because there's so many pedestrians in Durham, uh, you'd be waiting there forever. Uh, vehicles on the main road, over a side road or driveway, have the right of way. Blind people, we know they're blind because they've got the guide dog, you know, it's on a harness, they've got the the special um, uh, reflective blanket or um, jacket on indicating it's a, a guide dog. Or we could tell that a person has a white cane with a red tip. That's another indicator. They may not have a dog, but they're just using the cane. And as we said earlier, if you're there first, you get to go first. I don't have this video. I couldn't find it, so I didn't load it in. So maybe I'll have to throw throw it into the program a little bit later. Uh, be very careful when you're fooling around in a vehicle. I thought this was an interesting article where a sister accidentally runs over and kills brother. Can you imagine going home uh, and telling your parents that you just ran over your, your, your younger brother because you were fooling around in a mall parking lot? playing like a game of chicken, uh, don't mistreat your vehicle, meaning stay inside it. Don't let people jump on the hood, the roof, the trunk, and, and drive them around a parking lot. Um, you know, let them hold on with a skateboard or a bicycle. These are all things that on the surface seem like it's a lot of fun. You can laugh about it, but something could go wrong and then you're gonna have to pay the consequences. Okay. And in this case, even though it's a sibling, I still think you can be brought up on charges if something happens to a family member in a vehicle. Like this was taken um, on a Saturday before a UNH football game. What's wrong with this? I'm hoping that everybody in the bed of the pickup is older than 18 because if they're younger than 18, they're breaking a law. Now, legally, if you're over 18, you don't have to be in a seatbelt. So could you be in the bed of a truck? Yes, but you probably should be sitting down. And look at where the, the vehicle is in the right picture. They've crossed over the center line to get 
into the parking lot a little bit earlier. I mean, that's not smart. They may have to speed up if a car starts coming. So what are some of the basic thoughts about having people in a vehicle? Don't let them sit on the hood, roof, or trunk like we said before. If they're in the pickup truck, make sure they're sitting down. If they're younger than 18, they're in the bed. I mean, in the in the, in the the cab with a seatbelt. Um, don't let anybody sit in the front of your car uh, unless there's a seatbelt. So no more than three people in the front seat. I skipped over one. Don't carry anything to the left side of your car. If you want to put something out the right side, it can't extend more than six inches. Um, don't be in the back of a utility trailer or a house trailer. So we're not talking about a Winnebago. We're talking about a camper that has a hitch. Okay, that's a house trailer. And here's one that you probably don't know. Uh, tethered. And I'm going to get out of here for a second. So tethered, let me explain. Tether to dog means that you you take your, your leash and you tie it on one side of the bed of the truck. And then you take another leash and you tie it on the opposite. So tethered means it's tied on either side and there's some slack. So the dog can go from side to side. They could even go forward or they can go back. But the worst thing would be for a dog to see another animal jump over the side and you're, you're dragging the dog with you down the road. So tethered means secure where there's movement on either side. And that takes care of signs, signals, and pavement markings. So let's talk about, well, I gotta get out of this. So excuse me here, but I gotta get right back to the beginning. I had looked at what I needed for movies and I went through this earlier today. Okay, now we're back at the beginning. So, with stopping, what I want you to write down, you must see ahead to plan ahead. We talked early this week about how important vision is. So, the only way that you're going to know that you need to stop is that you're going to be looking far enough down the road and the time frame that you want to be looking, remember, is 20 to 30 seconds up ahead. That is how far you're looking. That's where that target, okay, that you're looking to guide you down the road is. This is an older commercial that they had, and you'll notice that the tires lock up, so they don't have anti-lock braking system. But what I want to show you from this, this video is that once you hit your brake pedal and you hit it as hard as you possibly can, it is now up to the vehicle to stop you. You can't do anything more, except maybe pray that you don't hit somebody. But watch this commercial. Just five miles per hour over the 30 miles per hour speed limit. How much further will it take to stop? One foot, two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet, seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, ten feet, eleven feet, twelve feet, thirteen feet, fourteen feet, fifteen feet. 16 feet, 17 feet, 18 feet, 19 feet, 20 feet. Twenty one feet. Okay, what I want you to write down is that I want you to drop your speed by five miles per hour in a high-risk area. So I'm talking where there are a lot of pedestrians, 
lots of cars coming from the left to the right, joining into traffic. When you start have to be picking up multiple situations, you should be going at or below the posted speed limit. There is no reason why you should be going faster than what is posted. So time does matter. And the only way you're going to get more time to stop for something is by going slower. That is going to give you more distance to stop. Uh, what would happen if you could go back and change things? So this is kind of a, a newer uh, video. Uh, same type of thing about stopping. But whenever there's a pedestrian hit, injured, or killed, they always do what they call a uh, reconstruction of the incident or accident crash. So what they're doing here is that they're looking at skid marks and they're thinking, okay, where would the car would have stopped if it was going the speed limit or slower than the speed limit? So this is where you see a crash and then they kind of rewind it and then they play it forward again where it should have or how it should have gone down. What you're about to see will change your mind about speeding. Two identical cars, one traveling at 60, the other at 65. A sudden change in the road ahead, and both drivers first react, and then, a moment later, they brake. And things start to get interesting. Down here, the difference is extraordinary. In the last five meters of braking, you wipe off half your speed. So this car is still doing 32 k's when it hits. This one also hits, but only at 5 k's. So no matter how good a driver you are, 5 k's difference up there makes 27 k's difference down here. Okay, it's not quite the uh, commercial that I wanted to show. I did the wrong Australia commercial, but it's the same um, um, idea of going slower. Now, 5Ks turns into about, I believe, right around 7 miles per hour or something like that. Um, so kilometers, um, it, it's a little bit different, but just go slower is, is the main thing. Um, I don't want you to write down the whole paragraph here, but I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Even when road and vehicle conditions are ideal, so we're talking about the perfect day, okay? Your car is in brand new, the road is newly paved, you're talking about the best condition and your condition, you're perfectly alert. It takes a lot of distance to stop a vehicle. Most people will always guess a lower number than what it actually takes. Like if I was to ask you, and let's let's just do it and I'll I'll tell you basically what the answer would be. At 20 miles per hour, how long would it take you to stop your vehicle from the time that you see it to the time that you come to a complete stop? I want you to put down in the comments how long or how many feet does it take you to stop at 20 miles per hour from the time that you see something to the time that you stop. And then I will tell you what the correct answer is. And let's see what we get for answers. All right. So I'm going to just give you a minute. I'm going to throw the music back here on for a minute.
15 feet, 45 feet, 30 feet, 15. You guys are actually a little bit better than my other classes that I've had. There's some of you that are spot on. Okay, the, the correct answer would be between 45 and 55 feet. And there are other things that go in, but the average stopping distance is 45 to 55 feet going 20 miles per hour. From the time that you see something to the time that you stop, it's roughly right around 50 feet. A little bit less, a little bit more, depending on weight of the vehicle. Guys did a really good job. Good guessing. I've had people say 12 feet, 15, 22. Um, it's just, it's amazing that people think that they can stop in 15 feet when they're going 20 miles per hour. That's that's a car's distance. So it, it it's it's quite different. So in your notes, what I want you to write down three things must happen to stop your vehicle. So like we were saying, you have to see what's happening up ahead. So one is seeing the danger. Two, your your brain must tell your foot to step on the brake pedal. Now, you may think that's an obvious thing to state, but if you're distracted, if you're not focused, if you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol, or if you're fatigued, like you're falling, starting to nod off, there's going to be a disconnect between your brain telling your foot to go to the brake pedal. And lastly, your foot must move to the brake pedal and operate it correctly. So the last part of the equation is not only using the brake, but using it correctly. How many of you have driven with your parents and they don't think that you're going to stop for something? And they're screaming at you, brake, 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 slow, slow, slow. They they don't sense that you're going to be able to do what you need to do with the distance that you have left. In your mind, you think that you do, but your parents have interpreted it and they're seeing it a little bit differently. I've got to see what I've got here next up here on the top. Yeah, some of these videos just aren't going to work. Okay, now these four definitions I do want you to write down. I am going to be testing you on um, one of these terms. So human reaction is the time it takes from the moment you see a danger until you step on the brakes. It's called reaction time. So from the time that you see it to the time you go move your foot over to the brake. Now, the distance that you travel is called reaction distance. So the, the moment you take your foot off the accelerator, go over to the brake, you are still moving. So you've gone a certain distance. Now, what I have found for the average person, this is going to take you about a quarter of a second, less than a second to go from the gas to the brake. Here's the interesting part. That reaction, three quarters of a second, you're going 11 feet for every 10 miles per hour. So if we were trying to stop at 20 miles per hour, just going from the gas to the brake, the car's gone 22 feet. The minute you saw something and went from gas to the brake, you went 22 feet. If you're on the highway going 60 miles per hour, when you go from the gas to the brake, you've gone 66 feet. So you multiply 6 by 11. So whatever... The speed is 50, 40, it's 4 times 11, 5 times 11. That's giving you your reaction distance. Okay, so the higher the speed, that longer that distance is going to be. So it's not the same. It's not the same for every speed. The last part of the equation is vehicle reaction. That's It's braking time. The time it takes for the brakes and the friction between the road and the tires to stop your vehicle and braking distance is the distance your vehicle travels during this period. So the first part of the equation, the last slide, 
deals with you. This slide deals with the car. And if you did your reading in the textbook, when they talk about braking capabilities, they listed 12 things that goes into braking distance, the type of braking system that you have, the brake pad material, brake alignment, okay, maybe they're a little faulty, a little worn, your tire pressure, how much tread that you have on your tire, the weight of your vehicle, the suspension, how your car goes up or down. Suspension is how your car bounces. Okay, does it hit a, a little bit of a bump in the road? Does it lift up away or does it keep your tire kind of glued to the roadway? The coefficients of friction to the road surface. So this is all from your reading in, in chapter 12. Even, you may not believe it, but the wind speed will have a an effect on your stopping distance. Not a big one. The slope of the road, the surface and the smoothness of the road, and your braking technique as a driver. So there's a lot of things that we have to contend with when we have to come to a brake. And if it's a normal brake, we usually have control. But when it's an emergency brake, all these components that we've just mentioned play a bigger role and your, your stopping of a vehicle. The one that really gets to me the most is um, tires. Most people do not understand tires. This is why when I gave you the assignment of know your vehicle, I wanted you to know your tire size. What I want you to write down in your notes, I would like you to write down, don't ever buy cheap tires. A lot of times you want to save money, but you don't want to save money on, on brakes or tires. You may want to save money on oil changes and windshield washer fluid and things like that. But tires are so important to the control of your vehicle. Now, what I would recommend is look at the cheapest tire, look at the most expensive tire, and then look in the middle and get a mid-grade. Get something that's in the middle of the road. It's not going to break the bank, but it's going to be better than the poorest of tires that you can choose from. Um, this is going to show you the difference of what tire depth will do. We tested the effect worn tires have on stopping distance. 60 miles per hour on a wet road three sets of tires, each with different tread depths, and one professional driver. When the driver accelerated to 60 miles per hour, watch what happened when he tried to stop. While your actual distances may vary, it took him nearly 10 additional car lengths to stop on worn tires. So, when will you stop? Ask about our complimentary tire inspections. So I thought that was interesting because we take it for granted, um, our tires. Now, they're going to do car inspections on your vehicle once a year. This is what they're trying to alert you to is that your tires are wearing down a little bit. It's going to be time to, to purchase a, a new pair. And the thing I want you to understand about tires is, and I'll, I'll get out of this for a second, Understand that when you go shopping for tires, that they do not like replacing only one tire. So if it's the front right tire, they're going to want to replace both. Okay, so they're going to either want to replace two of the front or two of the back, even if it's just one in the back that's that's worn. Okay, because by doing the two new tires, either front or back, it gives you the same tr tread depth on both those tires. So they're going to wear evenly. And it's going to give you the same. So if you bought a, a new tire because it was flat, you know, you hit a nail or something, and then you um, got a new tire on the left side in the front, and the right side you left where it is, it, it's not going to feel the same. It's not going to ride the same. Now, if you rotate your tires, which should be done about every 6,000 miles, five to 6,000 miles, 
what you want to do is to take the back tires, move them to the front, and when you move them to the front, cross, cross over. So the back right is going to the front left. The back left is going to the front right. And then just take the two front tires and move them directly behind you. So left stays left, right stays left. It's all because if you have a front wheel drive, it's just how it wears um, the tires. Okay, so that's why they, they do it in that order. Um, one last slide for stopping, and I wanted to mention road surface. So in your reading, they talked about three types of roads. One that is, um, let's see if I can find it real quick here. I opened up the, the book here tonight because I said, oh, I don't think I've talked about this. So I'm going to try to find where it is. It's on page 265. So write this down in your notes right now so you can look it up. 265. They're talking about the road surface. You need to know the three road surfaces. One in the book talks about a banked road. And I'm going to get out of here for a second. Okay, a banked road goes high on one side and it slopes down. So this is a banked roadway. The second roadway that they talk about on page 265 is a crowned roadway where it's high in the, on the, the top and then it slopes down on either side. Now, because of a banked roadway or a crowned roadway, it's to get water flowing off to the side of the road. Okay, it's to give you um, also better adhesion on turns. So a banked roadway is going to allow you to have a higher speed making that turn. Think of um, race cars. Okay, race cars always have a banked uh, racetrack. They never are on level ground. Okay, and the third thing that they talk about is a flat road surface like a parking lot um, it's all going to be flat there's no crowned uh, there's going to be slight because there's some drainage in a parking lot so at some point it will start to slope down a little bit but for the most part you're not going to have the um, the crowned roadway or the or the banked now I've got a question that I want to ask you and I want you to answer it on on YouTube here because we're gonna enter now talking about speed so we're gonna just talk about speed a little bit tonight and then we're going to uh, get into it more on Monday and finish that up on on Monday um, most people once you get used to a vehicle and driving um, you get used to going the speed limit it just doesn't quite satisfy your feeling of getting around anymore and you're gonna to wanna to go faster. It's just a natural thing. I think your parents were probably the same way. I was the same way when I was younger um, because you believe that your skill level is getting better. So I, even though the speed limit's 30, why can't I go 45? Why can't I go you know, 50 in a 30? The road is still bare. There's no bad weather. There's nobody else on the road. And just remember, just because you can go that stretch at 50, even though it's posted at 30. Nothing bad happens the few times that you've done it. At some point, it, something bad could happen, okay? And what they want, and the reason why they post speed limits, we'll talk more about this on, on Monday, is to let the, the most people go the same speed. There are always going to be some people going a little bit faster, a little bit slower. So what I want you to do right now in the comments, I want to see who's still here. And try to be as honest as you can. Um, I know that this is being written and it's just our group that's seeing this. Well, maybe, maybe I won't do this question. Do this in your own head because I don't want this to be on YouTube where people can see well, the question is, okay, I always ask my class every time we talk about speed and everybody talks about going 30, 35, 55, 65. Those are the speed limits we have in New Hampshire. But we know that people have been in cars going much faster. So my question is, and I always want to know, what is the fastest? Now, you're not the driver, but you've been in a car. What is the fastest you've been in a vehicle while someone's been traveling? Yes, and um, Alexander just asked a question. Um, 
Is it better to slow down gradually or rapidly in extreme situations with rain and snow? Always slow, unless it's an emergency. So if you're planning ahead, you should be planning ahead. It should be slow. But in an emergency, um, time is of the essence. Uh, but it could make the situation worse too. But like I said, how many of you have been in a vehicle going really, really fast? Don't have to answer that if you don't want to because most people don't want um, other people to watch YouTube and see that they said that they were in a vehicle going 100 miles per hour. Um, let me show you a, a video. Now, a lot of people say, doesn't being a driving instructor make you nervous? Not really. I do have a break. Um, there are situations where students have been in a bad situation and I didn't know how they were going to handle it. It didn't make me a little bit nervous, but for the most part, I'm kind of a calm guy. Um, I don't get that nervous. Um, but this video clip that I'm going to show you, speed, when you get speed going kind of fast and you think someone doesn't have control of the vehicle anymore, then it's going to make you nervous. And I always tell students, if you're a little bit out of control, look at the car salesman. I'm going to show you a picture of a car salesman going for a test ride. And he is so afraid of the person that's test driving the car because the way he's driving. Okay. It's all because of the way that you feel. The passenger is going to feel different with speed than you are as a driver. So let's see how this car salesman feels about this person driving the vehicle. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice and easy. We'll just head on out whenever you're ready. Are you ready to go ahead and, yeah. and drive? Okay, yeah, sure. Oh, whoa. <laughs> It's all right. Oh, a little more than I'm used to. Yeah. It's got some power, so just get a feel for it. Okay. Okay, all right. But ease off just a little bit. Ease off. So I was thinking a little more age on me, some wrinkles, a little dorky, maybe some facial hair. And just somebody that I can pull off a, a fun prank with. <laughs> Let's go have some fun. My good friends at Pepsi Max have hooked us up with this cool cam cam. So these are the glasses cam to show you everything that I see. How you doing? Hello. I'm Mike. Steve, nice to meet you, Mike. I saw you sort of gravitated towards the Camaro. Are you thinking about getting one? Oh, no, no, no. This this way too much car for me. I'm Well, it's a lot of power, but they've designed it to be very safe. I don't know if I can handle it. I, I've never driven anything like this before. Well, I, I tell you what, I think a way to really make you feel comfortable would be to put you behind the wheel. You're good. <laughs> what are you driving now? Oh, just a minivan. Oh, yeah. yeah what am I You're signing not obligated. here? You You're sure? not, it's just a checkout sheet for a test drive. You're not obligated to anything. It's just so we know who's out. Let's go give it a drive. Ready I'm getting a little nervous. No, I'll be right there beside you. There are your keys, sir. Thank you, Steve. You'll have to unlock it, Mike. Oh, yeah. thank you. Okay. There we go. Oh, yeah. What a car. Mm -hmm. Well, we better buckle up. Yeah, good call. Power. Power door locks. Standard, of course. You are liable for any damages to the vehicle, so please stop the car. Slow, or at least slow down. Slow down. Slow down. You can't go through that gate, Mike. Stop! 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 Watch it! Watch out! You're gonna wreck this car, and you're liable for it if you wreck it. Mike! Stop the car! Stop the car right now!
cops. No, no, you don't understand. It's not what you think. I'm it's not what you cops. think. No, it's just a prank. We're just having fun. Look, this is a camera. Here's a camera. There's cameras. Look, it was all just fun. Look, I'm Jeff Gordon. Now, when I first saw that commercial, I was rolling on the ground laughing. I mean, I thought it was so funny because at times I'm holding on to the door frame and I feel a little bit nervous, but you think that you're in control. But did you notice in the video at the very uh, the commercial at the very end when he found out he was a race car driver, his perception of what was safe and not safe changed because he knew that he can actually handle the car and do this type of thing. Okay, he wasn't really out of control. So really what you think is in control and what somebody else may think is in control could be totally different. And, and that's where we've got to watch out for. Because you do have to listen to what your passengers are telling you. Because if they feel uncomfortable, remember you are responsible for the life and welfare of the people that are in your vehicle. So if someone is speaking up and saying that they feel uncomfortable the way that you're fooling around or driving too fast, you should be responsible and, you know, go a little bit slower, make them feel um, a little bit more comfortable. Um, let me just get back to, oh, no, that's not the one I wanted. There we go. Speed. So is going the speed limit always the safest speed to travel? Um, the answer to that question is no. Sometimes you're going to have to go slower because of rain, Sleet, snow, bad weather, fog, all these things are going to come into play. Could going faster than the speed limit come into play? Sure. If you've got to get by an obstacle before another car is coming, you may have to go uh, faster. Uh, so there are some situations where you're going to actually change what you're doing. Um, I want you to write down these two definitions. So what is a safe speed? One that allows you to have complete control of the vehicle. So that means that you can make your turns, you can stop it. Um, anything that you need to do, you've got complete control. There is no second guessing. I hope I can do this. You got it. And then the last thing about what would happen if there was a real emergency, like a flat tire, um, engine problems, electrical problems with your vehicle, um, could you handle bringing the car back and check on the road, bring it to a place where it's safe to pull over and deal with the emergency that um, just arose. So I, I always tell people, I think the state did a good job talking about stopping first, because if you always drove thinking about, can I still stop the car when I need to, then your speed's never going to get out of, out of control. But if you like going 70, 80, you know, 20 over the speed limit in town, there are going to be times that you're going to need that time and distance to stop and you're just not going to have it because you, in the back of your mind, you forgot. You forgot how much effort goes into stopping a vehicle and we don't want that to happen. So what are some of the situations or factors that go into um, can, uh, determining a safe speed. One is road conditions. So curves, slippery conditions, bumpy roads call for lower speeds. How well you can see darkness, rain, fog, snow, intersection, hills, curves, parked vehicles keep you from uh, seeing well in call for reduced speed. And lastly, how much traffic there is. So the heavier the traffic, there's going to probably be more hazards on the road, more things that you've got to be thinking about. You should probably bring it back just a little bit. I think this is going to be a good place to uh, stop on the topic of speed. I do want to take a moment and talk about um, what is coming up next week. We're going to finish up the section on speed on Monday. I have a uh, impact video that I want to show you on speed because it deals with high school kids fooling around in a car. And you're going to have to answer some questions about uh, what you thought of the video. Um, and we've got to finish this PowerPoint, which will take us um, a little bit of time. And then we'll probably save the midterm to Tuesday. Okay, so we're not going to have the midterm on Monday. It will be Tuesday. 
Okay, does everybody understand that? So up to this point, I haven't sent back corrected uh, chapter test. Let me get the, the textbook here. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right, from here. All right. I haven't sent back corrected answers. I've looked through them. Uh, the answers look mostly uh, correct. Every once in a while, people had one or two wrong. But this is what I'm going to do is on Saturday, okay, I will probably send out an answer key to all the chapters that we went over. So you could take a look of what you sent to me. So you'll have all the correct, you could just match it up. And those that you got wrong, just go back and look at the question. Now, I am also going to um, call people out, not by name, but your phone is where you're sending all your homework in. I am looking through, today I went through people's names. There's a lot of missing homework, okay, from people. So make sure your chapter review, which isn't a lot of work, 10 to 12 to 14 questions, okay, from your reading and from what we've covered in class. So make sure you get your homework. If you have any homework that is not done, I'm not gonna send you the answers of to what it is. I'll let you take the midterm, but you will not be able to take the final at the end of the program if you have any missing homework. It has to be completed. Also, someone texted me tonight saying that they couldn't find the worksheet on our special page on Facebook. All of you are members. I've already looked. You've already become a member. You've got to go and you've got to find the link. Okay, it's usually where there are downloads. Where you, Chapter 3 is what we had for last night. So I'm going to give you the remainder of tonight to get Chapter 3 into me. Right? It. Um, I took it off my desk. I had it on my desk. Um, I don't know if I've got it on the board here. Hold on. Let's see if I can um, see Chapter 3. I'm going to throw it on. There we go. This is what I sent you. This is what you're looking for. This is on Facebook. Whoop. There's actually two pages. I was trying to see if I could just flip through it. Okay, so there's a backside to this. But you will find this on Facebook. All right? That has to be completed. All right? And those chapters. But for the most part, at least half of you have got all your stuff in and I've been pretty pleased with it. Um, the posters and the videos that we do this week uh, still a couple outstanding things that people haven't done. So make sure you get your seatbelt or airbag or helmet project done to me. I'm going to try to show it. If we have like 10 or 15 minutes left at the end of a, of a class, then I may um, show some of the posters. I'm definitely going to show the um, video that um, I think it's, um, um, is it Sam that did it? I'm trying to, to see here if I can find. Yeah, Sam did an awesome video that we're going to see at some point. So that is it for tonight. Um, it's a hot one. So hopefully it's not too hot where you are because right now the these lights are just really, really hot. So have a good weekend. Study for your midterm. Uh, it will probably be on, it will be on Tuesday. We'll finish up on speed on Monday. Uh, thanks for tuning in, uh, participating, putting comments in. But now you got to check out. So I know I'm looking at my clock. Should be right around 9.15. You should be checking out. So have a good night. See you on Monday.